Hello world. So today we're going to talk about how to build a powerful brand, powerful brands for musicians. Hello everyone. So this is going to be something new that we're hoping to start on a regular basis for making it with Chris G. So we're really late on podcast this week. So I wanted to deliver some additional content for you guys as as a thank you for being a loyal audience, for being here every week, and don't want you guys to not have anything to, to learn this week, and want to have some really great information, and this is actually something we want to do, so this is a, a motivation to start start this now, right? As Greg Rollett said, ready, fire, aim, like stop waiting, just start doing, and we'll have actually a clip from that a little later on, but this is from one of the lectures that I usually start my classes off at FIU, Full Sail, or whenever I, I teach somewhere at, at a university or college or guest speak somewhere. But branding and story is the foundation of music, it's the foundation of business, uh, it's the foundation of anything because you need a powerful brand and a powerful story to lead people to the music, right? So unfortunately, music is the last thing that matters until people hear it and then it becomes the only thing that matters. But we gotta lead people to the music. and. We don't need to emphasize a ton of time on branding and story, but getting that foundation locked in is really, really important and just being very consistent with that foundation. So what is branding? What comes to your mind when you think about branding? Think of your favorite musicians or your only your favorite musicians or favorite bands and or first one that comes to mind. And when you think of them, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Think of some, some characteristics, maybe some words, some sentences to describe them. What comes to mind? And whatever you just thought of, that is branding, right? Was there something that they did that made you think of these things? It was probably something they'd have done on a consistent basis over and over and over again. So what I always like to say, if you're trying to build a brand to be the next Oprah, the next Mother Teresa, but you're constantly getting into bar fights, uh, you're probably not going to build that kind of a brand, right? You're gonna be known as the idiot that gets into bar fights. So branding is your consistent behavior, what you consistently put out there into the world. So today we're gonna to look at a couple of rules to help you build a powerful brand, to help you get one step closer to, to making it, uh, to build that powerful brand. So we got nine rules. I'm gonna share a couple of stories and a couple of clips. Some of the clips come from the podcast, and there's two clips in there that are not necessarily from the podcast. Um, just taking a risk at putting those in here. I'm going to obviously give them, give them credit and where they come from, but um, and references on all the clips and everything that you see in here will be below in the description of this video. So make sure to check those out to learn more. But let's dive in. So the first rule that I have for building a powerful brand is to narrow your focus. You have to be really dialed in on what it is you want to do. You can't be everything to everybody. So when you first start out, it's, it's super important to just focus on one or two things and consistently over delivering those one or two things to your audience. You can't do everything. So when you look at people like, like Jay-Z or Beyonce or these, these crazy entrepreneurs that are doing so many different things, they've already have a, a built-in business, a built-in team. They have the finances and the resources to do many different things. But when they first started out, they were laser focused. They were super dialed in on what they're doing. So I have a, a case study for you or a story to share. Um, so here's a picture of Mike Studd performing at the social in Orlando. I went to this show, not necessarily a Mike Studd fan, but I went with Greg Roulette and we wanted to go see a cool show. And I was just very inspired by his story and how he's really built his brand. So Mike Studd started off as a baseball player. It was a high school star, basketball and baseball player, then eventually became the pitcher for Duke University. And he had a career-changing injury that prevented him from taking his dream to the next level, from going to the pros. So he decided to pursue his other passion, which was hip-hop and rapping. And in 2011, he started doing music full-time. And the, he narrowed his focus on hip-hop that is focused on the college lifestyle and sports, right? So everything that you see within his brand has to do with sports, the college lifestyle, and, and hip hop music, just having a good time. So it was really narrow on his focus and build a really great audience with that. And it was very consistent with his content and had that narrow focus in his content too. There's several videos where there's sports and the college lifestyle in, in his brand. So you wanna narrow your focus. 
Don't try to do everything in the beginning. Become really good at one thing first and be super consistent with that. So here's a quick clip from Gary Vee and Chase Jarvis from a live uh, conference they did or live talk that they get, did at Photo Plus. So check this out. Here's an incredibly optimistic thing to do. This is exactly the moment for you to take a step back. If you feel you're in a beige or you're vulnerable, I've got something really fun. Take a step back and become a super narrow niche expert in a certain genre, AKA 1980 to 1984 Smurf dynamics. <laughs> and this is gonna be really fun because if you love your craft and you have other interests, this is where you get real, real, real narrow. Let me give you something super weird. I take photos of high school wide receivers. Now that is narrow, <laughs> but you have to understand why it's powerful. On the human psychology, most parents think their kids in high school that play football are gonna play in the NFL. They're delirious, right? <laughs> which means it's a huge market. Which means, that, and, and I know how narrow that is, but if you love high school football, if you live in Texas and it's religion, like you will find unbelievable opportunity when you react to expansion. Yep. You have to contract. What's amazing is you can contract in something you've always loved. Tea, you love tea. Go deep into tea. Take a photo of every tea leaf ever from every fucking angle ever. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I've seen this over and over. This is true pattern recognition. This is not my intuition. This could be an incredible keynote for you because you're gonna win twice. You get to be fruitful in your craft and you get to do it around the thing that you most narrowly love. Spoken. It's interesting. And, 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 and maybe you hate Instagram today, but Instagram can help you so much because what you can do is you can start taking three photos a day posting on Instagram and using 10, 15 hashtags around tea, chamomile, black tea, samovar. Like you can do it and people will start discovering you. And then if you actually put in work to actually make your life happen and spend another hour going to all the other tea photos and adding your two cents, commenting, becoming part of the community, you will be baffled by what will happen. All of a sudden, in, in a six month period, you've got 11 different tea companies asking you to take the official shot that they're putting on their package, then one of them becomes a big tea brand and you get to live the rest of your life walking around and seeing your picture. I mean, this is real, what I'm telling you. And, and notice how interesting it is, and I know you clapped and you really caught my attention, I appreciate it. This is where optimism beats pessimism. Woe is me, all these fuck faces with a fucking iPhone have taken everything away from me. <laughs> Or, holy shit, I can take photos of Cocker Spaniels for the rest of my fucking life. So the next rule of building a powerful brand is the law of category. The law of category is either creating a new brand new category, right? A brand new subgenre or a brand new style, a very different new way of doing something. And either be creating that new category or recognizing it out there in the world and then uh, becoming the leader in that category, right? So the example I like to use is hip hop music. So the people that are accredited and depending, this could be a, a giant debate, but uh, the people who are credited for starting hip hop was DJ Cool Hurt and Africa Mbata, right? They, their unique style of DJing and mixing music and combining disco with uh, what they were doing they created the culture and the sound of hip hop. They were one of the first ones to pioneer that sound. However, so they were the first ones to, to kind of to create that new category, right? If you want to say being the first in a category. So you don't always have to be first. You can all just find a category that's really cool and join in that culture and then work really hard and become a leader in that category. So after DJ Cool Herc and Africa Mbada uh, came Grandmaster Flash. And Grandmaster Flash saw what they were doing, but then took it to a whole new level. So he added his own spin, so I guess in a way his own category to it, and brought it to the next level and became kind of like the, the grandfather of hip hop. And even though he wasn't first, but he quickly became the leader of hip hop and helped to make it even more popular than it already was starting to get in their in its underground culture. So become the leader of a category, right? So create your own category and become the leader of that category. 
So the next rule is the rule of quality. Whatever it is you do, whatever your, your niche is, if you're a songwriter, if you're a musician, if you're a manager, a booking agent, whatever it is you want to be, go all in. Like the Malcolm Gladwell rule of 10,000 hours, try it as quickly as possible, get your 10,000 hours in, right? Jeffrey James, in one of the podcast interviews we did, he talked about this rule in Nashville, that the first 200 songs that you write are, are all junk, right? You don't start writing the good stuff until you get past 200 songs. So when it comes to quality, you wanna put as much energy and time into your craft. If you wanna be a successful songwriter and in 2017, you only wrote 10 songs, you are way behind. You should probably be writing 10 songs per month. Um, if you look at some of the most successful songwriters out there, I had a, heard a really cool podcast with Chris Stapleton on the Joe Rogan Show. And he talked about how he had three writing sessions a day uh, five days a week, right? So writing 15 writing sessions a week. And he got to a point where he had over a thousand songs. And, that, and it took him 16 years to get to where he is at today. So it took a very long time. And if you look at some of the most successful songwriters out there, if you look at the charts, all the most popular songs, you want to be one of the hit makers writing at that level, you have to write as much as possible. Those guys are, uh, and girls are, collaborating with some of the best musicians in the world on daily basis. They're always writing. So if, to be the best musician, the best songwriter, always be working on your craft. Practice your live show, practice your instrument, practice your songwriting as often as you can. Make the time, because that's the most important thing. And here's a quick clip from an interview, that not one of my interviews, but it was an interview with Dave Grohl that he did for Drummer's World. What would you tell four guys in a garage that had a good batch of songs? What would you tell them to do today? To go play live. Just play live. Honestly, if you're good at what you do, people will recognize that. I really believe it. I really believe that going out and playing good songs live as a great live band will make you successful. I really think it will, and it doesn't matter if you're at the shithole down the street or you're on the side stage at Bonnaroo or you're headlining Lollapalooza. If you're a great band with great songs, people will notice it. That's it. All right, so here is the next rule. The next rule is the rule of visuals. So visuals are super important, right? So when it comes to visuals, you want to make sure that your video, your photos, your graphics, your website are to the best of your ability. However, this comes with a disclaimer. When it comes to the best of your ability, you don't want perfectionism to hinder you from doing anything at all. The best thing to do is to just go. So there's this concept of ready, fire, aim. And we're going to hear a clip from my, my first podcast interview, actually, with Greg Roulette in just a second. But when it comes to visuals, you want to Put out the best quality photos, the best quality video, the best quality logo, um, the best quality website that you can. However, just start. Just start with whatever you can. We have the luxury of having these amazing cell phones uh, where we can take great 4K video now. You can do really high quality photos. You have no excuse to not start doing right now. You don't need the perfect equipment to get started. Just start doing. The worst thing you do is, so the Einstein quote, right? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you start using your iPhone or your, your Samsung, whatever phone you have, and you start doing video and photos, but that's all you ever do and don't ever get better, that's insanity, right? So start using your phone and putting out the best quality videos you can, and then each time, try to get better. Try to use better filters, Try to make sure you wipe your lens, something Herb said in one of our podcast interviews, right? So take your lens and your shirt, and maybe your shirt's not the best thing to wipe a lens, but wipe the lens and then take a photo. Um, so simple, simple things like that. Use better filters and then slowly start upgrading your gear and start upgrading your lighting, you're upgrading your camera so you have better quality visuals. So here's a quick clip with my first interview with Greg Roulette and where he talks about the concept of ready, fire, aim. For most of us in, in the context of what we're talking about today, if you try, I think people are scared to fail. Yeah. But the truth be told, if, if you start this podcast and you do it for 90 days and no one listens, 
no one's even going to remember that right. 92 days from now. Right. Like the worst case scenario is you just recorded 90 days worth of episodes, met awesome people, had great conversations, and you built your network. Like that's right. worst case scenario. Yeah. And I think most people's worst case scenarios, they play it out in their head like, oh my God, no one's ever going to talk to me anymore, or I'm going to embarrass myself, or dude, I don't remember like what I watched yesterday or listened to yesterday. <laughs> and so we're very forgiving people. Uh, there's really nothing to be afraid of. You know, when you put your music out there, no one watches your video. No big deal. Like yeah. that's the worst case scenario when in context of like, should I go out and like, for me, it was when should I quit my job and start my business full time? Mm. And again, I think we're scared about what's on the other side of that. What happens if I fail? What happens if my business doesn't do well? What happens if I go on tour and it's a complete disaster? Well, guess what? When you come back, you can get your bartending job again, Yeah, you exactly. know, or you can get a different bartending job, you know, like that worst case scenario for most of us. Now, a little different position I'm in now. Like I got two kids, I got a wife, I got a more, like I'm in a different situation now than I was when I was 23, right. 24. You can't just take a full on risk and like let everything go. Like you still have some kind of responsibility now that you have to. Like, right. But if you're 20, of. if you're high school, college, just out of college, even mid twenties into late twenties, and you don't have that, that overhead or those responsibilities, the worst thing that can happen is you go back to where you are now. Right. You know, like people are like, well, I'll never, well, yeah, you can just go back and get the job. Like, you know, you're working at like Kohl's, go get a job at, you know, Walmart. Like it's, you know, yeah. it's so I think that's the biggest thing to, to your point about like, just get started is yeah, just get started. Give yourself uh, so we talk about Tim Ferriss, someone we both really like and respect. So he did, uh, when he first launched his podcast, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, I'm going to do four episodes or I'm going to do eight episodes. Right. I'm going to see what happens. Yeah. Now it's turned into a million dollar plus business for him. It's been, yeah. been several years of it. Um, but give yourself those limiters say, all right, I'm going to like for you, you're going to do, you're doing this a uh, huge Twitter thing right now. And mm-hmm. it's freaking awesome. But you're like, I'm going to commit to it for 12 weeks. And if at the end of 12 weeks, I'll reevaluate, like, was this good? Was this productive? Did it help grow my business? Did it help not grow my business? And I'll make a decision. But you do it for 12 weeks. Well, guess what? Now you got 12 weeks of data, new fans, people that know you, that don't know you. You're getting new introduction. Like, just you have to get out and start. Well, when to be an entrepreneur, you kind of have to fail to, like, to learn from your, from your mistakes and to, like, build that business that you want to build. I mean, shoot, you've built, built several businesses since I've known you. and Yeah, and not all of them are successful, right? <laughs> yeah. Of course not. And... Um, you know, here's the thing. So talking about failure, I don't set out with the intention to fail. Right. Right. I, I think that's the wrong mindset. There's a lot. Of, if you go, go to like Instagram and you see these motivational quotes and it's like, you have to fail so you can learn. Like, I don't set out to fail. Like, I yeah. don't want to. Yeah. Fail. Nobody, nobody like, wants to fail. I want hopefully. your Twitter thing to go great. I want my TV show stuff to go great. Um, but you do learn from some of your mistakes and you make them better. Yeah. It's OK to pivot. It's OK to change a little bit. Even with Ambitious.com, we're just a little over a year old. You know, we pivoted three times. Mm-hmm. I don't consider any of it a, a failure, but you start going down one direction. And you're like, ooh, I don't I don't really like that. Because, mm-hmm. again, I went out and I tried something, got feedback, and now I can adjust. I, I like in one of my favorite books of all time is by Michael Masterson. It's called Ready, Fire, Aim. Okay. And the context of the words that I want people to understand is most people in life go ready, aim, fire. Mm-hmm. And they get stuck in aim. And they get stuck in AIM forever. So I'll just use the context of like, you want to start a podcast. So you get ready. Cool. I want to go start a podcast. Then you get into AIM. Oh, what microphone should I use? Right. And that's like six months of like going to Guitar Center and looking at what Amazon. What questions and should I ask? Googling I everyone. What questions should I ask? Who should I interview? Uh, what should the name of, oh, for God's sake, like what should the name of my show be? You can right. agonize over that for like months. Yeah. And then the artwork. And so we get stuck in this aim forever. As a musician, again, it's like, hey, we want to go out and we want to record a new album. And then they get stuck in aim forever, which is, well, let's write new songs. Well, I don't like those songs. Let's write more songs. Right. Or let's go and record them. Uh, let's re record the drums. Uh, let's, I don't like the bass line. Let's re. And all of a sudden, two years have gone by, you don't have an album, and the fans who liked you two years ago don't care about you anymore because they've moved on. Yeah. And so Ready, Fire, Aim says, let's get ready, let's throw it out to the world, and let's get real-world feedback. Like, even if it's not, like, so in my band's case, uh, when I was doing the music thing, like, something, like, we recorded that CD in, like, seven days or something. Right. Like, super fast. We did the artwork. I, like, called a buddy. We made the artwork in one night. We launched it. Was it the best album in the entire world? No. Like, I don't think the recording was even that good, but guess what? We got to put a thousand CDs in people's hands and we got to get feedback and they would show up to shows. And so, again, it doesn't always have to be perfect, right. but you don't get anywhere you, if you, you never do anything. Gotta- so next is the rule of collaboration. This is something that happens all the time in the world of hip hop, jam band world and songwriters at the highest level. They're constantly collaborating. They're constantly working with other people to push their skill level to the next level. So what I say all the time is. If you're starting out musician, starting out songwriter, 
You're not going to write with Max Martin and the best songwriters in the world right out of the gate, right? The best thing you can do is find one of your peers, so another songwriter or another musician, and just collaborate with them. If it's someone that wants to get better and you want to get better and you work together and want to make each other better, then you're going to raise the skill level of yourself as a songwriter, as a musician. So collaborate as much as you can. Collaborate with like-minded people, collaborate with people with, from different walks of life, with different ideas, and just challenge yourselves to become better songwriters, better musicians, better marketers, better managers, whatever field it is you go into. You should always try to collaborate with others. By collaborating with others, not only are you raising your skill level, but you also now get exposure to other audiences. And that's a way to really quickly build a brand, right? So figure out something of value you can add when you collaborate with someone. So if it's someone at your same level, you're basically just sharing your skills to make each other better, right? But let's say you are someone has a thousand followers on uh, on YouTube, or it's even a hundred followers, and you want to collaborate with someone that has hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of followers. Most of the times, you're probably going to get laughed at when you approach them and want to collaborate with them. However, if there's something of value you can bring to them, if you are a really good graphic designer, you're good at video editing, editing, you're a good photographer, if there's some kind of skill that you can bring to the table that you feel like is a need to them, then approach them with that skill. You can send them a message on Instagram or send them an email or whatever it is and say, hey, uh, really like what you're doing. Here's, um, I feel like I could really help you with your photos or your videos or your, your graphic design. I'll do it for free. I'll commit to the next three to six months to deliver one design per week. Um, you have full creative control. Don't feel obligated to use anything I provide, but I would just love to collaborate with you on a song. I would love to have a co-write session with you in exchange. So it's, Simple as that. Or you could pay for someone to collaborate with you, right? So, but by collaborating, not only are you raising your skill level, you are getting exposure to a bigger, wider audience. And that's a quick way to really build a really powerful brand. Next, focus on depth, not width. So let me explain what this means. Depth is quality fans, not mass amount of fans. Just because you have Thousands of followers or millions of followers doesn't mean that you have true fans. Like your 1,000 true fans, as Kevin Kelly says, right? It's about finding true supporters that are willing to buy tickets to your shows, that are willing to uh, buy your music, share your music, people that are champions of you. There's way more value of having a 1,000 people that are 100% engaged versus a million people that are 1% engaged, right? Depth is way more important than width. And just to give you two quick examples, there's an artist that I booked. I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but this person had 5 million followers on Instagram, several million followers on Facebook, several million followers on Twitter. And they played a show in Orlando at a 300 person venue and sold 50 tickets. Nobody showed up. Nobody cared. And so wide following, massive audience, but couldn't sell a ticket. And it's so unfortunate. And then there's m many other musicians. So one of artists I've worked with in the past, Zach Deputy, uh, who we've done many shows with, he doesn't have millions of followers. Not even, he's not even hundreds of thousands of followers. It was tens of thousands of followers, maybe not even 20 at the time. And he sold out this exact same venue. It's 300 tickets, sold out. And again, it shows you the, the, the difference between depth versus width, right? He has committed fans that are going to buy tickets. They're going to come to the shows every single time. And those are the real fans that you want. So I'm going to play you guys two clips on with this uh, idea or this rule of depth versus width. And the first one is from Jasmine Starr. She's a social media marketing expert and a social media influencer. And she talks about the importance of building the right fans versus having mass quantity of fans. And then the second clip, and these are both from my podcast interviews. The second clip is from Meg White. She's a booking agent for ICM. And she talks about... Um, the importance of selling tickets, right? I asked her about some tangible items that artists could use to get a booking agent and to get on people's radars. And the ultimate tangible item is how many tickets can you sell? Uh, it's even more important than than having a wide following on social media because, again, it doesn't mean that it's going to sell tickets. So here are these two clips. 
where does someone begin of creating their uh, profile of their ideal fan and where do they find them? That's a really great question. And it's a question that I'm asked the most because I'm such a big proponent. There was a time in social media where being popular was more important than being profitable Mm -hmm. because nobody looked at social media as a way to grow your business or your bank account. Now, you know, in the short amount of time that social media has really revolutionized the way that business is done, now everybody knows it's not about being popular. I mean, hey, that helps. And sure, numbers are credibility and numbers are flashy, but I don't want a million followers more than I want a million dollars. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's more important to be profitable than it is to be popular. And so, you know, I, I, I believe, and this is kind of like a tweak on a Dale Carnegie quote, like, I believe that you will go farther being genuinely interested in two other people than trying to get 200 people interested in you. Mm -hmm. We, and that's what social media does, right? We want to broadcast an image. We want to broadcast these busy things that we're doing and how we're hustling and look at us go. (laughs) And as a result, we want all these people looking at us. But I think that the most powerful way to use social media specifically to grow your business and and your profitability is to create value for your followers. Mm -hmm. But first you need to know who you're trying to attract. Now, if you go to jasminestar.com forward slash ideal client, Mm -hmm. I have created a a short like list of questions that you can ask yourself because it's really important in any industry. I have had the luxury of consulting with entrepreneurs, with medium to small businesses and large scale organizations and um, companies. Mm -hmm. And every time we start the conversation, it starts right here. Who is your ideal client and who are you trying to attract? Because once you know exactly who that person is, is it a male or female? Are they between the ages of 20 and 25 or 40 and 45? Big difference. You know, what platform, what social platforms are they going to be on? Where did they last go on vacation? What's the last YouTube search that they have? Where do they normally shop? How do they spend their free time? Do they subscribe to magazines or digital fair? Like there's a lot of stuff to get into the minutia of understanding because once you know who that person is, then you can create marketing content. You can create branding collateral. You can um, have start online conversations that are going to attract people who will ultimately turn into customers. And that is the key. You want to get noticed, start talking to the right people. More tangible things. I mean, socials are so difficult because there are artists that I love and whose shows that I've seen that I love that their socials just aren't there yet because mm-hmm. it's such a weird mishmash of things that you need to have to to make it. And I tell my artists a lot of the time, there's no perfect formula either mm-hmm. because there isn't one. Right. <laughs> you know, you could just get lucky and somebody hears a song and, hey, there you go. Um, that's really popular in the hip hop world. You get one song in the club and it goes quick. Um, but... Yeah, socials socials are a tough, tough thing because you would call that a tangible thing, but it's not because just because your social numbers are high doesn't mean that you're going to go out and sell tickets. Mm -hmm. And that's my agent brain working, Um, you know, because managers or other personnel, I know that a lot of A&R are looking at socials right now, but to a degree, some of that stuff can be bought. Right. Um, so you don't know how tangible that is. So that doesn't necessarily mean ticket sales, which is one of the most tangible things out there. Cause if you can sell tickets, you're clearly, you're connecting with people. Um, so I guess just to reiterate that then I'm the most tangible thing is that if you're going out and doing shows, especially in your home market and you're selling a lot of tickets, that means people are paying attention. They like you, you're connecting with them. Where else can you do that? Can you continue to build that locally? So the next rule is putting yourself in a box and temporarily, not not forever, but you have to be able to describe your brand, describe your music. So you have to put yourself into a box so others can understand what it is that you do. So with this, we're going to play, we're going to do a little activity. We're going to play a game. But before we do that, here's a quick clip from my interview with Greg Rollett where he talks about this concept of putting yourself in a box. And then after that, grab a pen and paper and be ready to work on an elevator pitch to describe your music. Look, I, I think as and we I had this problem when I was a musician. Mm-hmm. We didn't sound like anybody. Right. But you can't say that. Right. But I think every musician wants to say I'm unique. 
Yeah. But you, but that's and everyone says that. And that's but not but that's bad. Right. I actually think that that is not a good thing because then the the booking agent doesn't know how to book you. Mm-hmm. The fan doesn't know like. You know, I'm a indie rock, jazz, hip hop fuse. Like, what the hell does that mean? Right. Like, I don't, I don't, I can't. Oh, we, you know, and then uh, you helped us in in our day. I mean, this is t- 12 years ago right. now, which is crazy. It just <laughs> made us old. Um, you know, like we were like, oh, we're we're a hybrid of Linkin Park and 311, mm-hmm. and people were like, oh, I like 311. Yeah, I would I like that, that type of music. Right. So if if you can find that, we're like this and that. Um, I mentioned earlier about our uh, TV show. Mm-hmm. I'm like, we're a mix of Anthony Bourdain meets Shark Tank. And people right. go, oh, I've seen Anthony Bourdain before. He's that travel guy, right. cook guy. Right. And so they can they can put me in a box mm-hmm. and to say like, oh, I would check that out. Right. Now, once you do that, well, I know who Anthony Bourdain's fans are because I could just go to Anthony Bourdain's fan page and see who his fans right. are. Um, I could go to Shark Tank's fans and see who Shark Tank's fans mm-hmm. are. And then you can kind of hodgepodge it up. So. I, I think that you want to put yourself in a box when it comes to marketing. Right. Now, when it comes to being in the studio, be as unique and right. original and creative as possible, but no one's going to listen to your music if you're, you know, the jazz, funky, fusion, space-infused, EDM, hip-hop group. Like, right. no one knows what the fuck that means, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, I, 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 just I love that because you kind of do have to put yourself in a box when it comes to explaining to others. Cause Correct. Because others are probably living in a box. Yeah. And yes, you're an artist, you're creative, and you do all these amazing, unique things, but... Not everyone thinks that way. And by putting it in a box, I like that you compare it to two different things. Because the yeah. second you have, I sound like 20 different artists, like that's going to confuse people also. It's just yeah. saying Linkin Park and 311, people can connect with that. Right. And even though you guys didn't sound anything like either one of those bands, it still got their attention. Right. It still got them to check you guys out and, and they became fans of it. So I love that whole concept. Of yeah. It's, it's just mashing up. And again, like, you know, you could say I kind of sound like Taylor Swift mixed with Metallica. Right. Like weird. They don't mix at all. But at least in the head of the person, they're like, all right. So it's probably a female singer that has heavy guitars. You mm-hmm. know, like that you have to paint that picture for them for the fan to kind of take that step. And mm-hmm. I, musicians hate doing that. Artists right. hate doing that. Right. But the but you got to think about it. if you really want to build a fan base the fan needs to be able to identify with you absolutely uh, all right so here's the elevator pitch game what we're gonna do this comes from uh i got this from a cd baby uh diy musician podcast this is something they did at their cd baby uh diy musician conference and this is a game of building an elevator pitch so again we're putting ourselves in a box just so we can explain to people what it is that your music sounds like so Again, using branding and story to lead people to the music. So the first thing you're going to do, you're going to take a piece of paper. You're going to write, make three columns. And in column one, this is your classic column. These are, this is a column where you're going to put five artists who are similar to your music that are household names that everyone would recognize. By household names, I mean people like Jay-Z, The Beatles, um... Jay-Z, The Beatles, Beyonce, uh, Bruno Mars, Michael Jackson, Led Zeppelin, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Red Hot Chili Peppers, I blanked there for a second, but big household names that everyone would recognize. So make a, a list of those five names. Then next, and feel free to hit pause if you need to hit pause, but then next in uh, category two, this is your contemporary category. So here you're going to put a list of five artists that are similar to your music that have released something in the last one to two years or or in the last five years that are more current artists. They don't have to be household names, but uh, maybe p- artists that people in that genre, your, in your genre, would recognize. Uh, so this could be like an Ed Sheeran. It could be a Halsey. It could be someone newer, like a great Avant Fleet, if you're like a classic rock style artist, but something that people recognize within your, in your genre, people that are within that genre. It doesn't have to be something that everybody would recognize. So that's column two. Next is column three, and that is your wild card column. So in this column, you're going to put th- words or phrases that describe your music. Words, phrases, and give you sentences. Something that describes your music. And then what we're going to do, we're going to take all three columns, and we're going to mash them up and create an elevator pitch. So let me show you two examples. This first example is for, from a friend of mine's band. They're a band from New Orleans. They're kind of New Orleans funk band. And the way I described them was a blend of old school Red Hot Chili Peppers meets highly suspect with a New Orleans flavor. So category one, the classic household name column is Red Hot Chili Peppers. Category two is highly suspect. And then I used a couple of words or phrases, right? So I had old school funk as one of the phrases, New Orleans music, New Orleans flavor. Uh, So I just basically took 
a couple of phrases and two, those two artists. So we want to just use one artist from each column and just mash that together, right? So that's what I got for, for this band. I'll show you one more example. This one's a little longer, and it's where I use the few words and phrases. This is from my friend Emily Kopp, and I describe her music as a Fleetwood Mac-style, free-spirited songwriter with a catchy Ingrid Michaelson-like pop sound and a rock and roll attitude. So the classic column, Fleetwood Mac, the contemporary column, Ingrid Michaelson, it's a little older, but uh, still newer, so someone in that genre would recognize Ingrid Michaelson, but Fleetwood Mac is the classic uh, column artist, right? And then a few words and phrases that I used, I used the free, free-spirited, uh, catchy pop sound, rock and roll attitudes. So I used a few phrases to mash this up. But you want this elevator pitch to basically be one sentence. So something you could say in an elevator, in an elevator you have like five to 10 seconds. So you wanna be able to tell someone in five to 10 seconds what your music sounds like. So you're putting yourself in a box temporarily just to get their attention, just as Greg mentioned in the, the clip that I have played for you guys, right? So put yourself in a box just to get someone interested into the music and then once they hear the music, then they'll hear the, the beautiful magic that, that you create, that you want to share with the world. And hopefully because of that, that you led them to the music now, now they'll become fans and become big supporters of what it is that you do. So the next rule is the rule of consistency. So my, here we have my friend Mike Studd again. So consistency, whatever, in everything that you do, it's super important to be consistent with your brand, right? So remember the, the, the Oprah Mother Teresa example I used in the beginning? If that's the brand you want, but you're consistently getting into bar fights, guess what? You're gonna be the idiot that gets into bar fights. When you wanna build a powerful brand, it's important to be consistent with that brand. So consistently, you want to uh, put out music, you wanna be consistent with your visuals, consistent with your collaborations, all the rules that we talked about, consistency strings it all together and you want to consistently put out content. So using my friend Mike Studd again that we talked about earlier, he's super consistent with everything. So when it comes to his merch, here's a picture that I took at that show from his merch, and it all matches that sports and fraternity, college lifestyle culture, right? His merch is on point. And that other, the picture next to the merch, that's a picture that he took the day he was in Orlando, and he posted that on Instagram. When he was in Orlando, he went to a store called Trophy Room. That is the store from uh, Marcus Jordan, the son of Michael Jordan. He was a basketball player for uh, UCF, for the Golden Knights. And uh, he has his own store in, in Orlando at Disney. It's called Trophy Room, and Trophy Room is a sports memorabilia store. So even his promotional photos, his day of show promotional photos, is him at Trophy Room shopping and with the big shopping bags of stuff they bought at Trophy Room. So even that is consistent with brand. And not sure if this was on purpose or <laughs> probably not, but his girlfriend in the picture. She's the daughter of Jose Canseco, legendary baseball player. So like even his girlfriend is consistent on brand. I don't know if, he's, if it's still his girlfriend today, but at that time, that, that was his girlfriend and hopefully the, they're, they're still together and in a very exciting, happy relationship. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. So consistency is the key. And in this next clip, I'm gonna show you a clip from one of my favorite marketers, Joe Polizzi, who has some amazing books on marketing, Killing Marketing, Content Inc., Epic Content Marketing, and he talks about the importance of consistency and the importance of content and the importance of being consistent with that content. And that could be a whole nother video and discussion, but I just want you to think whatever it is you do, whatever you do, just want you to be super consistent with that. So here's the clip by Joe Polizzi. So we've done a lot. I mean, I've spent 20 years in this industry doing a ton of research. And what we look for is, OK, what what's the best way to build an audience, whether we're looking at media companies or content marketing examples, product brands, whatever the case is. And and without bar none, all of these examples do the same thing. They focus on, for the most part, one content type. Is it audio? Is it video? Is it textual? Is it image? So they focus on that first. And then they say, well, let's pick a platform then. Is it my blog or website? Is it YouTube? Is it iTunes? Then they consistently deliver. So let's say that your musical group is starting a blog. And, you, mm -hmm. and I say, well, how many times are you going to blog? You say, well, we blog two times a week. I'm like, no, you don't. You blog you deliver one blog Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern time and then one on Thursday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern time. And you do that until the data tells you not to. Mm -hmm. Just like you just like the new we used to get the newspaper every morning at the same time. And when we didn't get it, we were depressed. Right. <laughs> so we want to set the expectation that great things are coming and deliver on that and not default where that's what a lot of uh, 
A lot of music groups do it. A lot. They basically were inconsistent with our communication. So consistency is really, really key. And then it takes time to do this. So if you said, Joe, I want to do this content marketing thing. I've got like six months. I would say I can't. I can't tell you're going to get any results in six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe some qualitative information, but it really takes 12 to 18 months plus to really build an audience, mm -hmm. a loyal, trusted audience. So those are the four things. Wrap that in a bow where do you actually have a differentiated story? Are you delivering valuable information that's different than anything else out there? And that's what we've seen. So look back in your traditional examples. Look at what the New York Times did. Mm -hmm. They started with a print. Um, newspaper. Look what Huffington Post did. They started with one blog. Mm -hmm. That was it. Now they've got like 400, 500 blogs, but they just started with one. Whether you like Rush Limbaugh or not, he just started with a radio program. Right. You know, those are your, our, sort of our traditional media examples. And then look at, you know, John Deere, you know, big you know, tractor uh, company. But people don't even realize how John Deere became John Deere. They started a magazine in mm -hmm. 1895 called the Furrow Magazine. If you said, who's the largest media company in the farming agricultural industry? I would say it's not a media company. It's John Deere, 1.5 mm -hmm. million subscribers, 40 countries, 14 different languages. Wow. So it's, I mean, been going on for 120 years, mm -hmm. not talking about John Deere products, right. talking about what are far they're targeting farmers what are farmers pain points what's keeping them up at night how can they be more profitable on the farm what technology do they need to use mm -hmm. those are the things that they're doing so that's the type of thing and then if you think about some some smaller case studies and my good friend john lee dumas started a podcast you probably know entrepreneur on fire yep. mm -hmm. he podcast. basically started by doing a, a pot nobody was doing a daily entrepreneurial podcast and he said maybe there's an opportunity for me to do a daily entrepreneurial podcast i was something like guest number 1154 on his podcast <laughs> he up to that point he delivered 1153 podcasts in a row delivered at 3 30 a.m eastern time and that's how he built an audience and that's how he became a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. whether you're a musician whether you uh, whether you're into food whether you sell software as a service products whatever the case is the model remains the same and what i love about this model chris is that everybody thinks oh we've got to tell stories on every platform well, that's not what the data tells us. Right. The data tells us to do one thing really, really well, build your audience, and then once we you build what we call a minimum viable audience, then you can go ahead and diversify and say, okay, well, I started with a podcast, then I'll do the YouTube thing, mm -hmm. then I'll do... Uh, then I'll do a magazine or whatever the case is, but you have to start with the audience, one platform, one content type at a time. And what I love, it's just so simple and unfortunately nobody does it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed this first lecture style video. And just remember, just to summarize, narrow your focus, become the leader of your category, quality, 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 use very good visuals, there's no excuse to have bad visuals. Collaborate, depth, not wit. Put yourself in a box, describe yourself to uh, the market. And then once they become uh, part of your tribe, part of your brand, then they will really see the magic that it is. Uh, it makes you uniquely you. And be super consistent with everything you do. And until then, go see shows, meet people, make stuff. Peace, everyone. Mm -hmm.